I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Six of Northern Minnesota's community college campuses are now united under one name. We will talk with the president of Minnesota North College. It was a historic week for the Fond du Lac Band as the tribal burial ground on Wisconsin Point was officially returned to the tribe. And we'll remember the life and legacy of Senator David Tomasoni of Chisholm. These stories and voices of the region up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac Nora. Thanks for watching. And Denny, it's good to be back after a week away for the WDSE membership drive. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, it's it's always great to have people donate to the station because this is how we operate here at the WDSE. And uh, we're really very thankful for what they do. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking a little bit more about we that will. later in the show, but let's begin right now with the headlines. All right, very fine. Thank you, Julie. Well, 15,000 nurses in the Twin Ports and the Twin Cities authorized a strike this week after failing to reach agreement on new contracts. Nurses at St. Luke's and Essentia Health are among those working without a contract. Nurses can now call a strike after giving a 10-day notice to their employers. A $9.5 million federal grant will help the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa build a new transit center on its northern Minnesota reservation. Minnesota Senators Tina Smith and Amy Klobuchar announced the U.S. Department of Transportation grant this week. The Boys Fort Band also received over $700,000 to purchase six propane-powered buses and build a propane fueling station. A community partnership will save a long troubled block on East 4th Street in Duluth and create some much needed affordable housing. The Brownstone Building at 621 to 633 East 4th Street will be named Brewery Creek Terrace and will include 16 units of affordable housing. One Roof Community Housing, Superior Credit Union and Essential Health are financing the project which will be built by developer Heirloom Property Management. And at its annual meeting this week, the Greater Downtown Council announced a name change. The council's new name is simply Downtown Duluth to reduce confusion that the organization might have been part of the city council. The organization manages more than 900 blocks of the city's commercial district from Canal Park to Second Street. Well, six campuses of northeastern Minnesota's community colleges have been united under one name and one vision. Minnesota North College will offer a seamless experience to students who can take classes offered on any of the campuses while receiving a single transcript and bill. And so, joining us now to explain more about the college merger is Mike Ryich. Mike, of course, president of the Minnesota North College. And Mike, thank you for being here. Welcome. What was the reasons for the merger? Sure. Uh, we, we kind of put the reasons in two buckets. One, one is just simply the state of, of higher education across the country. Uh, the demographics of our region and of the state uh, are a little bit troubling for higher ed, and so enrollment tends to uh, suffer a bit. Uh, and so we're seeing uh, declining enrollment, which of course means less resources for the colleges. So we need to work a little smarter, a little more efficiently and, 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 and together. Uh, but the, the real reason is uh, by working together and leveraging the power of a larger organization, we can definitely serve students better. You mentioned a seamless experience for right. students, and, and that's, that's a big part of it. Students can take courses from different campuses uh, under one transcript. There, there are many more offerings that, that used to be siloed at a single campus that now are, are offered across multiple campuses. And so it's really about uh, a better experience for the students mm -hmm and a better experience for our community partners who can now look at us as one organization instead of five separate organizations. Mm -hmm. This has been a long process moving in this direction and you've been part of it for a long time. For people who are not really familiar with what the goal was, talk about the, the campuses that are actually now part of Minnesota North. Sure. So we used to be five independently accredited mm -hmm. colleges with six campuses mm -hmm. because one of our colleges has two campuses. Um, what we've done is taken and put that all together as a singly accredited college, 
but we kept all of our campuses open. So those campuses, uh, if you start in the north, are in International Falls, that's our Rainy River campus, and Ely is our Vermilion campus. We have the Eveleth and Virginia campuses that make up Masaba Range, and then we have Hibbing and Itasca. So a, a broad swath of, of beautiful country, and we like to say we cover an area about the size of Maryland uh, well, with what we do. Does the merger affect the marketability of the school? We, we think it really improves the marketability because we can market the whole region now. Uh, we came up with the tagline of Head North, Head North of Minnesota North College, Head being a cerebral thing sure. for higher ed, and, sure. and everybody loves to head north. If you're ever in the cities, what do people do every weekend? They head north. They head north. And so we, we thought that would be an appropriate tagline to bring people to our beautiful region. Every one of these campuses has a, a long tradition as an individual college. Um, what's being done to preserve those those community identities? Because yeah. people feel really <coughs> strongly about the schools yeah, it, and the teams. Yeah, and you, you hit it on the head there. And what we kept was just as important as what we changed. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the original tenets of, of merger was we keep community connections alive, we keep campus identities alive through niche programming, through keeping our foundations at, at the community level, and, and by keeping our athletic programs. We were able to keep five separate uh, uh, athletic programs and, and we'll be competing among one, one another, but uh, it, was, it was a key to the merger is to recognize that these places are important to the community and, and we, we preserved as much of that as we could. How might these campuses differ from one another? You know, they, they differ by programming. We did a, always a good job of not duplicating a lot of programming because we just couldn't afford to. And so they, they, they differ mainly by programming, but what they don't differ uh, in is their commitment to students. We have, uh, I just traveled all the campuses and spoke at them this week with our faculty back, and just optimism and, and care for people is, and kindness. Sure. We, we stress kindness. You, you'd know that, Denny. Yes. Uh, <laughs> be kind. But um, it, that, that's what they have in common. Mm -hmm. Businesses and industries across the country are looking for workers right now. Is there an advantage um, being a uh, a school that really focuses on two-year career programs? There, there is an advantage. There, there's a desperate need for skilled workers mm -hmm. uh, all across uh, every part of the economy, and so that is where we come in. The disadvantage of that is uh, when, when the economy is so strong, uh, people sometimes tend to go straight to work and, and not seek higher education uh, because they can, and, and I, we always see the problem with that is then if the, when the economy does turn down, uh, we have uh, folks that th then will come back. And, Speaking and of the economy, later. what kind of financial aid might be available for students? Yeah, uh, two-year colleges are affordable and, and financial aid is available between the, the federal Pell Grant, the state Pell Grant, uh, the loans that are available, and the scholarships. We have five foundations supporting our students, so uh, we don't like to get lumped in with the bigger schools that mm -hmm. are much more expensive. Students can afford to come to a two-year college with the support we offer. Mm -hmm. And will the faculty be staying the same at all of the campuses? For the very most part. Uh, the, the, it, we're so far apart, it's hard to <laughs> have them travel, but when we hire new faculty now, uh, we do uh, have them understand there possibly may be some travel among some of the closer campuses. Mm -hmm. How are local businesses involved in kind of getting those, those niche programs that you talked about uh, set up at each of one of the yeah, campuses? Yeah, they, uh, you know, and it, it's based on geography, so mm -hmm. our mining programs tend to be Eveleth and Hibbing, right, and our, our environmental programs tend to be up in Ely. And so our businesses are located in those regions and they help our colleges by serving on our advisory boards and letting us know what type of programming they need. Is there any indication enrollment might be up at these five campuses? Not this year. Uh, it, we're still a little post-COVID uh, lagging, but uh, you know, and with the economy strong, but uh, we're, we're taking a whole new approach to enrollment management and to recruiting and marketing, and uh, we're looking forward to next year and, and seeing what that will bring. All right, Michael Ryich, the president of the New Minnesota North College. Thank you, Michael, for Thank being you. here. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. The Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa celebrated the return of sacred land to the band Thursday. Parcels of historic burial ground on Wisconsin Point and along the Nemaji River were formally returned to the band at a ceremony at the Black Bear Casino Complex. Videographer and producer Thomas Soderberg brings us this report from the ceremony.
This is the place where we, is our center of our universe. So we understand this. When we do ceremony like this, we center ourselves in this cosmos. They're going to protect their loved ones. They're going to protect their ancestors. And that is exactly what we're trying to do. My grandmother actually told me the story that if we ever got the property on Wisconsin Point back, she would be the first to build a home out there and live there again because she's missed it so much. She may not be here to enjoy it, but I take my kids, my grandkids down there and they enjoy it for her. So, and we know she's there. She's always with us. It's always really meaningful to see uh, tribes be able to reclaim their sacred places. And there are a few places more sacred than where we choose to bury our ancestors. For me and my role uh, on behalf of the Department of the Interior, this is also meaningful because we want to see this type of collaboration between local communities and tribes uh, to work together on land management, uh, to respect um, the rights of Indian people and tribes, and, and also to uh, bring healing uh, for historic injustices. And so it's really meaningful to be here and help celebrate that. This is a, a truly historic event. Uh, we have uh, taken the Wisconsin Point burial ground as well as the Namaji uh, Cemetery mass grave and transferred both sacred sites back to the control and ownership of the Fond du Lac Band of Ojibwe. Uh, this follows a 100 year history after those, uh, that site was seized from the original inhabitants very unjustly. To Mayor Payne, and Council President Ben Sickle and the people of Superior, thank you for leading. Thank you for standing up in this moment. Thank you for showing the courage to tell our true history and to make the attempts. And I'm going to use President Ben Sickle's words. She, I saw a quote where she said, this doesn't make it right, but it's the right thing to do. This is your event. It is always your event. And we're happy to see this important act of justice the city of Superior uh, took a powerful step in working to repair the government-to-government -government relationship with the Ojibwe Nation in their support for the transfer of Wisconsin Point back to the tribe. Every elected leader, every community organizer has the opportunity to rebuild and renew their relationship with sovereign nations. You just have to start. Northern Minnesota lost a legend last week when Senator David Tomasoni died from ALS. His funeral was held this morning in his hometown of Chisholm. Senator Tomasoni was a staunch advocate for the Iron Range and one of the most well-liked senators at the state capitol. Here's an excerpt from his farewell speech at the capitol this spring. I guess the ultimate culmination came with the passage of the ALS bill earlier this session. All of you have been a part of that and it would not have gotten done without the support of each and every one of you. But I have to give a great big shout out to my kids for taking care of me in this last year or so as they have gone above and beyond taking care of me. My sister, Mary Jo and her husband, Richard deserve the same thanks. 
So many people have stepped up to help and I am eternally grateful. So Mr. President, members, thank you for accommodating me today as well as all session long. 30 years went by fast and I wish my successor all the best. Thank you very much. And joining us now to talk about the life and legacy of David Tomasoni is former state lawmaker Jason Metza, a good friend of the senators. Jason, thank you for being here. You were a good friend of the senators. You were at the funeral today. Big crowd. It was a beautiful event. Lots of people, uh, all walks of life. Uh, we could have practically and uh, probably literally done a special session uh, while we were there. And uh, <laughs> one of the messages from the senator was to pass the bonding bill uh, at that yeah. at funeral through his son. And, and beautiful he, event. He put 30 years in the state legislature. What legacy does he leave Minnesota? You know, what I, what I can speak to from, from my perspective as someone who was just so fortunate to serve uh, with him, you know, we had uh, President Riot here tonight, and, uh, you know, I, I think education would be first and foremost on my mind. They passed Iron Range Engineering, he and, he and Rukavina, two names that kind of mm -hmm. go synonymous with Iron Range right. politics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's made a huge difference. It's an accredited college for our region. Uh, but David did a lot of behind the scenes work. Every session, he had a, a, a little card and I brought this today as a prop. David, <laughs> um, I'll keep it a little more full than I have it tonight. Uh, but every day there would be a priority list for really? what he was working on. And it was always for making people's lives better wow. and trying to bring things that might not have been realistic. He might have overpromised a few times and we figured out a way to work on those issues together and deliver for his constituents and that's what he was all about was delivering for Northeastern Minnesota. You yourself spent time in the legislature. How did Senator Tomasoni influence you as a lawmaker and as a friend? You know, friendship is the first way I'd think of them. Uh, you know, in, in many regards, you go down there and it's a lonely place as a young person and he really just took me under his wing and I couldn't be more grateful, uh, you know, for the time uh, we spent together in that regard and the gentle nudging. Uh, Carly and I, uh, Maline, mm -hmm. were hugging this morning and remembering, uh, you know, all just the wonderful times where we were like, thinking we knew what was right and David was just kind of like nudging us in the right direction to get to a position where we could actually strike a deal on something for our region mm -hmm. and he was always a teacher uh, you know led by example and when I think of servitude leadership and someone that just is selfless and putting themselves out there for other people it's well, Dave. What was it about him that caused others to give him such great respect? you could sit and argue with the guy about anything in the world you wanted to and whether it was on a television program like this on the house floor in the living room or at the bar back home uh, casual conversations with friends on a pontoon david was going to be the guy to put to aside that disagreement at the end because he stood up for what he believed in all the time and that's i think you know something a lot of people uh forget sometimes mm -hmm. and he, he never lost those values and uh he could always have a laugh with you after. You know, that, that laugh was just infectious. I was talking with his son, uh, Dante and Danny today, and they said, if we ever lost dad in an event and didn't know where he was, they said, just <laughs> quiet down. We'll listen and we'll hear. <laughs> and, and, and that respect went across the aisle. It did. Um, it I, did. I read a quote from one Republican senator who described him as someone who had no enemies, only friends. Yeah, Dave, Dave was the guy that, uh, you didn't build a bad relationship with. If you were in the room with him, you were laughing, you were having fun, uh, and his positivity was infectious. Mm -hmm. And there was a great friendship between him and Tom Rukavina. Yes. Um, talk about that a little bit. Color so, colorful characters. Yeah, I, I think a good story, uh, which I didn't know if I should tell or not, uh, being on television, uh, was kind of my entrance into politics and the way the two of them operated. We had a large event for, uh, at the time, presidential candidate uh, Hillary Clinton. And we changed the location of the event the night before because Virginia had a morning paper and both sure. the guys thought it was a good idea. So I ended up letting the press know. 
Uh, we just didn't let their campaigns know, so we were getting calls from Washington. Both the guys kind of hovered in and really came around and just said, you know, it was the right thing to do. We got to get our people out, get them excited, because every election to those two was the most important election. Both guys believed so much in the power of getting out and voting, and it, it, it was just really touching to watch them and then go get to work with them. I need a short answer to, he gave credit to a lot of others. He didn't always take the credit for things. What does that say about him? He was selfless, you know. Uh, there's so many trails. When, when you think of David Thomasoni, you might think hockey, you might think, uh, you know, mining, iron range politics, uh, some of the staples there, but any trail system you're riding on had his fingerprints on it. Uh, he was just a guy who, uh, at the end of every year, really liked to pull out that thing and sure. show me, uh, hey, I got something in every single bill this session. You can't do that without building good relations. And with that, we have to say thank you very much. Jason Metza, former Minnesota state legislator, good friend of Senator Thomas Oney. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Thank you. Well, it's time now for our weekly segment, Voices of the Region. It's an opportunity to learn about some of the stories being covered by journalists in our region. This week, our guest is Danielle Kading from Wisconsin Public Radio. So some Wisconsin school districts are facing backlash over their plans to teach elementary school kids about gender identity. Uh, a group of parents are appealing a decision by the Superior School District to reject their complaint about gender identity to fifth graders. Uh, there, 30 parents are arguing that a lesson plan about gender identity is inappropriate for fifth grade students. And they want the Superior School Board to suspend that part of the district's human growth and development curriculum. Here at the school board meeting recently, um, there were dozens of parents, educators, um, and school administrators who spoke at the meeting. And one of them was Superior High School student Kennedy Popplewell. She told the board um, that she was nearly punished by a teacher who refused to accept that she's female and not male. And she and other parents and educators urge the board to keep the curriculum in place. And students like Pop well question why the board would remove a safe place for LGBTQ youth. And some highlighted higher rates of suicide attempts among transgender youth. Even so, com some community members called the teachings part of a political agenda. They say the curriculum places some students and educators in a position where they would have to abandon their own beliefs. And one college professor said the district is impeding free practice of a student's religion by teaching about gender identity. And the Wisconsin president of the national conservative group, No Left Turn in Education, uh, called it a parent's rights issue on what the students are taught. And the school board is set to take up the appeal in a future meeting. Bayfield County, uh, their board recently approved a resolution supporting development of up to 60 housing units in Washburn. It's part of a plan to address its housing shortage as they see high demand for seniors and workers. And a survey and housing report released last year uh, found more than half of the county's homeowners are 60 and older and more than 2,200 households are owned by seniors over the age of 65. Um, Kelly Peterson with UW-Madison Extension in Bayfield County says the county is on track uh, to have the largest share of seniors in the state by 2040 as the county's population has grown. Other needs that have been identified are for housing employees, as many places like across the rest of the nation and the state are seeing a worker shortage right now. Um, in Bayfield, one employer that I spoke with uh, said that they had actually bought a home so they could house their workers there because they were having such a difficult time retaining employees or even recruiting employees from outside the area because there just wasn't enough housing available. Um, so the county and other rural Wisconsin communities have really struggled to attract developers because building costs typically require higher rents than most people can afford. So the county is seeking proposals from developers through mid-September. 
the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency says a supplemental environmental review for the proposed $700 million gas plant in Superior failed to fully review climate change impacts and greenhouse gas emissions. And if built, the EPA says the Namaji Trail Energy Center could cause around $2 billion in climate damages from greenhouse gas emissions. The plant would be built by three utilities, including La Crosse-based Dairyland Power and Duluth-based Minnesota Power. Uh, Linda Wynn with the Redcliffe Band of Lake Superior Chippewa says they, like the EPA, want a more thorough review of the project's direct and indirect effects, primarily related to upstream and downstream emissions from um, extraction of natural gas and also the transportation of it. The project's owners are still reviewing the EPA's comments and next steps on this project, and they maintain that the plant is needed to maintain reliable power as they transition to renewable energy. And environmental groups, however, say that it's unwise to build more fossil fuel plants in the midst of a climate crisis. We're almost out of time, but you can keep up with our show by following Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter. Visit the WDSC website for program updates, news about the station, and upcoming events, and download the PBS Video app to watch your favorite PBS programs on demand. Before we go, I want to remind you that we are in our summer membership drive right now, where you have a chance to support what happens here at WDSC. Public media provides a platform for us to create programs that are educational, entertaining, and engaging. When you tune in to WDSC, you are watching shows that are selected with this community in mind, and these shows are made possible through support by you. And so I'm asking you right now to show your support for local programming on WDSC. That's right. If you're not yet a member, now is the time. Think about all of the local programming WDSC provides to you, from doctors on call to great gardening to this show right now. The programming on WDSC WRPT is your programming. It's community programming. So show that local programs matter to you. Call 218-788-2844 or visit WDSE.org and make your donation to keep local programming strong. And if you make your donation today, we have some great ways to say thank you. When you make your contribution of $10 per month or $120 all at once, we will thank you with a Roku Express streaming device. This device gives you access to hundreds of free channels and all of your favorite apps, including the PBS and the PBS Kids app. Or make a sustaining contribution of $15 per month or a single gift of $180. And we'll thank you with a one-year digital subscription to the New York Times. With access to all New York Times content, including breaking news, politics, travel, and more. And if you can't choose, make a gift of $20 per month or $240 at once. And we will thank you with both the Roku Express and the New York Times digital subscription. The most important part is that you make your contribution to ensure that WDSE and PBS can remain strong in the days and months ahead. So please call 218-788-2844 or give online at WDSE.org. Thank you. And thanks to our guests and to the crew here in the studio. With Dennis Anderson, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.